Okay. Hello, everybody. My name is Hong Lu. I am with Cash Property. And today I have a bit of a different guest on. Um, we are going to be talking about real estate, but with a bit of a twist today. And I'm super excited to bring and introduce Morgan. And I was calling her Morgan Salesman, but she corrected me and said, it's not Salesman, it's Salesman. But I, yeah, so we'll, it's, it's, it's an inside joke on the salesman part. Um, Morgan is also a fellow engineer. So for all of us engineers who are watching, she she connects with us on that level as well. So we are going to be talking um, about, you know, maybe thinking about real estate in a slightly different way today in terms of the syndication and the fund that Morgan has. So um, besides that, Morgan, I'm going to let you introduce yourself. And then I'll, I have a couple of questions to ask you about what you're doing that's similar to real estate. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I really appreciate you having me on today. It's been great to to get to know you and um, kind of talk to you about, you know, the different opportunities that you've been involved with and, and kind of see how um, maybe my opportunity and the real estate industry run parallel to each other. And so, you know, my background, like uh, you mentioned, is traditionally in civil engineering. So I did, um, you know, engineering consulting for, for several years. Um, before I transitioned into my new job full time. And so, you know, I've always had a passion for real estate. I've got a couple of properties myself. Um, and then obviously that development background has been super helpful, you know, um, from the from that side of things as well. So um, although that was my traditional career path, I've had some opportunities come up for myself in the bourbon space. I'm originally from Bardstown, Kentucky, which is the bourbon capital of the world. And so when I was young and in college, um, I still had or I had the opportunity to invest in some bourbon barrels. And so I was like, that's an interesting opportunity to, to participate in. And, um, you know, kind of wanted to explore that. So got the opportunity to invest in those bourbon barrels. We've been doing that for about five years now. So the, the kind of process is we will buy them directly from distillery, age them uh, for three to five years, and then sell them to somebody that's called a sourcing brand or a non-distilling producer. And so, um, from the investor side of things, I have begun to create my own uh, program for investors to be able to get their piece in this in this industry. And so, you know, you and I had kind of talked about um, how the the opportunity parallels real estate. Um, and so that's kind of what I wanted to, to touch on today. And so, you know, the 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 way that the fund is set up, um, we will do capital calls to raise money and kind of, you know, um, get some investors involved. Um, they'll put up money once a year for four years. Our minimum investment is $20,000 a year for four years. Um, and then, you know, that's pretty much all the work that they have to do is put their money up. And so then over that three to five year period of time, these barrels appreciate just like real estate does. It gains value as, you know, as time goes on. And, um, uh, so, so you're getting that appreciation. It's, it's a, it's a, it's an asset that appreciates. So not only, um, is your money backed by a tangible asset, that asset's going to appreciate over time. Um, and so, you know, the barrier to entry here is a little bit lower than real estate, um, typically at least. So, you know, you're putting in a $20,000 commitment a year for four years, total of $80,000, which that $80,000, you know, that's probably pretty reasonable when you're looking in real estate on a small scale that may be, you know, a great entry level. Um, but this kind of lowers that barrier to entry as well. And so, you know, there is um, that opportunity for investors to, um, you know, diversify themselves while maintaining a an asset that has, you know, it, it's a tangible asset attached to your money. Um, and so, you know, that growth that you see over time is, 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 is great. So, you know, we are anticipating that we'll be able to continue to see 20 to 30 percent annual returns on our investment on this. And so, um, you know, after that three to five year aging process, which I manage for the most part, um, then you kind of go into the sales side of things where we're selling to what's called a sourcing brand or a non distilling producer. And so those are the people that, you know, you're going to see on the shelf that are not, not necessarily attached directly to a distillery. They, they have a brand, but they're not distilling their own liquid. Um, and so, you know, uh, the wine industry is kind of similar to this as well. You know, people don't necessarily always grow their own grapes. Um, they they'll source their grapes and they'll put that into their into their bottles as well. So it's very similar to that. Um, and so, you know, it, it's it's a great way for investors to diversify their portfolio. Um, it's a great way to kind of hedge against the recession because 
when times are good, people drink. When times are bad, people drink even more. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. there's a, a great opportunity there to, to kind of diversify yourself. You know, this isn't necessarily something that you say, I'm going to put all my, all my eggs in the basket and hit a home run with it. It's really just an avenue or, or vehicle to help diversify yourself. And, you know, when you're talking to people that invest in real estate, a big piece, you know, a big draw to that is you have a tangible asset. Yeah. So, you know, this is, it parallels real estate in, in that manner, um, all while having a shorter um, time frame for investment. You know, you got three to five years that your money's tied up rather than, you know, if you're doing a mortgage, you're looking at 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. Um, and some projects are, are that are larger, it can be even longer than that. Yes. So, um, and, you know, although we, we do have opportunities for investors to finance this, everything we've done so far has not been financed. It's investor funded fully. Um, so, you know, there are a lot of, of, of value add points to this um, that, you know, make it a unique opportunity. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of avenues where, where the two industries can, can, you know, parallel each other. Um, so it's a so pretty exciting thing things that I really like Morgan is that, you know, you're so young and you talk the lingo, like all of the terms already, like you threw out the words capital call, appreciation, hedging against inflation, assets, and you're talking about the tangible assets, you know, and when we talk about real estate, we talk about all those terms, right? And we use them and diversifying and, you know, and so one of the things that I really love is that, you know, you're so young and yet you, you have the lingo down, you have the experience already. And I love that, right? So one of the things that, I, I I just sort of want to start peeling back some of the stuff that you Absolutely. you said there because 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 you just offloaded like a ton of of knowledge and and information. So one of the things that you talked about was the twenty k per year entry level amount, right? Investment. Yes. Like I I actually really like that model because usually when I'm raising funds for my real estate deal, we're asking two hundred thousand from right. an investor, and they're coming in with all of it at once. Exactly. Like, like there's no breaking it over the time. Right. So I love like how you're, how you structured it in this way. So how did you guys come about doing it in, in this manner? So when we had originally started, um, I had invested with a program before this and we kind of did, you know, throw in what you can, let's see how this goes. And, and, and then we'll, you know, kind of adjust. And so I started when I built this company, I started with the similar model. I was like, what are you willing to do? And so when I sat down over time and looked at, you know, if everyone continues on this path of, yeah, I'm willing to throw you a couple thousand dollars here, a couple thousand dollars there, I'm never going to reach the goal that I'm looking for. And so, you know, I, I kind of did a little bit of an, an analysis of my business plan and said, okay, in order to reach this goal, which is to have, you know, we're looking to our first capital call is June 1st. So in order to reach the goal of having all of this accomplished by June 1st, what, what is the absolute bare minimum I can, I can do? And then I looked at the amount of people in my network and said, okay, I'm going to need to do some growth here. And so, you know, I wanted to put a, a, a minimum on there that was reasonable for, you know, maybe not necessarily the everyday average person, but for that minimum accredited investor, this is not something that is going to change their life. Like I mentioned earlier, like this is, this is an opportunity to diversify yourself. So, you know, although it would be great if my, all of my investors were putting in hundred thousand, two hundred thousand dollars a year, you know, yeah. that's not always necessarily reasonable um, to ex expect somebody to do and something they're unfamiliar with. It's a, this is such an alternative opportunity that I wanted to make that still a palatable opportunity for, you know, for the average investor. Um, although our standard is accredited, you know, I don't want, you know, it, it's very unreasonable to expect somebody to put that large of a chunk of change into something that they don't even understand necessarily. Right. Um, or, so, or okay. so I'm just going to clarify. So we're not talking about real estate where people live. We're talking about bourbon barrels. Yes. Right. <laughs> and yes. so that's what really intrigued me because I drink bourbon once in a while. And so I, I sample different liquors. So tell me why bourbon barrels and why, like, what's the benefit of it from where you live? Yeah. So obviously, you know, I grew up in Bardstown, Kentucky, bourbon capital of the world. There are rick houses in my backyard. I mean, we, we, there's mash, you smell it everywhere you go. 
Um, and, and, you know, so for me, it's always been a passion project, a little bit of a way to stay connected to my heritage. And, um, you know, it's always been something that's exciting for me. And then when I found the opportunity to invest in it and started analyzing the numbers, you know, I was like, this is a, you know, tangible business model that we could pursue for an extended period of time. And so, you know, the way that we add value to the industry as, you know, this type of business for a sourcing brand we allow them to maintain their um, capital for cash flow and their cash flow for um, branding and marketing. Because in this industry, that is the best thing you can do is put your money towards branding and marketing and having that brand recognition. And so, you know, if their money's, if they have a couple hundred thousand dollars tied up in, in barrels while they're aging, I mean, that that's leaves very little, if any cash flow for these brands to do what's going to make them successful. And so I like to say that we hold the financial responsibility of the aging process. That's kind of the the tagline that I like to use because it allows those brands to continue to have that uh, cash flow to to build their brand and get that recognition so that not only are we helping them get it on the shelf, they can get it off the shelf too, which Mm -hmm. is the important thing at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So now one of the things you mentioned was this 20 to 30% return. Can you elaborate on on what the returns are potentially? Yes. So, you know, we're looking at a 20 to 30% annualized return. um, That's estimated based on current market conditions today. And so, you know, if you're putting in, you know, that $20,000, you're not going to see returns until we sell the barrels. And that happens in three to five years. So, you know, over that three to five year period of time, we're looking at, a, you know, a rough appreciation of 250 to 400%. That's really what we're doing. And then when you break that down on an annualized basis, it comes out to be around 20 to 30%, which, you know, traditionally that's outperforming most assets, particularly S and P. Um, you definitely can find some real estate that's competitive with that. Um, but you know, in, in a, in a, um, in the market that we're in right now, you know, there's obviously conversations of a recession mm-hmm. and, you know, that's, this is a safe opportunity to kind of hedge against that because it's not um, tied to those typical indicators of, you know, like the stock market and, and business, you know, it's a, it's a very um, pigeonholed unique asset that's not necessarily tied to those typical indicators. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and you're right. Like, you know, in some real estate opportunities, you can see upwards of 20 to 30% ROI annualized, but then there's, you know, risks associated with that, right? right? And then even at the end of that time period, you know, there could be cash calls and there could be other things that come up that affects your return, mm-hmm. right? So you mentioned a capital call at one point, that's different from a cash call, right? Um, a capital call, it, it's it's just, it's pretty much the same thing as far as I understand. So you, that's when you're putting all of your money in. So I'll have, you know, June 1st, I'll say, hey, I need your money in the next 14 days. Mm-hmm. And so that's when you'll actually pay for those barrels. And then we'll have them filled within 90 days. And so then you'll have that tangible asset. Uh, okay, right. So so the difference, right. So the, the idea is the same, but, but here's the difference though. So your capital call, because you've already given the investors the heads up that this is happening every year, right? Whereas in real estate, that cash call. Okay. Yeah. We we don't plan for it. Right. Right. And so that's the big difference. Yes. Yes. And that's a good thing too, to mention, like, you know, like I said, a lot of the people I work with are credit, all of the people I work with are credit investors, you know, they're high net worth individuals and they, those, those type of people, that personality is really, um, excited about the opportunity to be able to plan where their money's going to go. They, you know, having that opportunity to say, okay, I know I need $20,000 by this date on this time. And it's an annualized thing, you know, then you can also kind of plan when you're going to get the the cash out as well, because you have that general time frame of three to five years, you know, it's reasonable to expect um, that you can uh, get that return and start planning what you're going to do with it. I mean, that's part of this business model is to to be able to see a a tangible plan of what's going to happen with your money. Because if you're putting your money, you know, in the stock market, you're really not sure when you're going to take it out, what it's going to do. Um, And in real estate, obviously the timelines are so much longer. So, you know, you don't have to do, or you can't necessarily do that same level of planning when you're talking about selling in, you know, 10 to 20 years 
um, that, you know, that timeline being shorter allows you to, um, you know, create, it participates in your five to 10 year plan rather than your 10 to 20, 30 year plan. Yeah. And so, you know, for me personally, I have always loved the idea of, okay, this is how I'm going to start raising my, or making my money right now. Um, obviously I have my hand in real estate as well with a couple of rental properties, but I, my plan is to take the, the, um, capital that I make from, from this business and put that into real estate for a long-term investment. And so, you know, for me, this is more of a shorter term, um, horizon. And so that's helping me plan for that long-term horizon as well. Mm -hmm. So if I'm hearing you correctly for, for other individuals who are trying to get into real estate and maybe only have, you know, the 20 to 30 a year, right? This may be another alternative to putting the money into the stock market or putting the money into right. a roof or a mix yes. and saying, okay, instead of going down that path where it's, you know, 20 or 30 a year, I can potentially look at this opportunity where I know it's going to be 20 to 30 K a year. And it's in an asset. It's, it's, it's almost like real estate, but it's not real estate. And so it's a shorter term. And then at the end of that time period, I can take the return and go and actually invest into yes. a physical yeah. real estate property. Right. Exactly. So, but, and then at the same time, you know, they still have their original capital back as well. Right. Yes. So it's not just, you know, so, okay. All right. The only, um, the only uh, money that you will not see back is, you know, the expenses over the lifetime of a barrel. And those are very minimal. I mean, you're talking about $300 over a period of four years or so, and that's included in your capital call initially. So when I do the analysis of what I'm going to spend your $20,000 on, it's inclusive of the um, purchase price of the barrel. There's an upfront management fee of 5% of the purchase price. So let's say the barrel is $1,000. That's going to be a $50 uh, management fee. And then we anticipate over a four-year time frame that we are going to uh, spend about $300 on, on your storage insurance, Avalorum, and, and things like that. And so, you know, to touch on that as well, um, we've built our own storage facilities to store these barrels. And so that has let us, you know, standardize the costs that are associated with this for our investors. So we know what the price of storage and insurance will be over the lifetime of the barrel. Uh, we have control over that because we do own those facilities ourselves. So mm -hmm. um, now how does it work? So after the four or five years, when you guys go to sell the barrels, do, do you still keep the barrels? Because I was looking online and there's reuse, like used barrels for sale. Yes, there are used barrels for sale. Um, and so we do not keep them. Once we make the sale to the, to the, uh, to the sourcing brand, they have every right to do what they want with the barrels. Now we have opportunities and partners that love the buyback opportunity. So we have opportunities to move those for them if they'd like, but normally they already have something worked out, whether that, you know, we have one customer that um, likes to send their barrels to a winery and, you know, use them as finishing barrels. There's all kinds of opportunities in, in that space as well. But, you know, our company doesn't necessarily benefit from that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Cause I was originally thinking like, it could be like, like fostering a child where, you know, you stick the, the, the person's <laughs> name on the barrel. Right. So that it's, yeah. Anyways, my mind was going a little bit crazy. There. <laughs> no, I, I get it. There's a lot of opportunities. I mean, this market is, is very unique and um, it's a niche market and, and, you know, they've done a really good job of keeping it a little bit of a hidden gem. Yeah. Yeah. And you're right. Like regardless of the economy, you know, people are always going to be drinking, right? And when the economy is worse, right, they actually do see an increase in alcohol consumption, right? Yes. So it's a bit of, um, yeah, like a, it, it's a bit of a social debate, right? Like, yes. <laughs> so and maybe um, social turmoil is more fair. <laughs> so, so now how else is, the bourbon business, your, your fund, very similar to real estate. So, I mean, I kind of summarize the ones that we've talked about, cause those are really it. So the, the, um, the opportunity to invest in a tangible asset, you know, your, oper your, uh, investment is backed by a physical asset. That is a, the biggest one. Okay. The but other hold one, on. So, so Morgan, with a property, somebody could physically just go there and touch it. And like, I've, I've gone to properties that are in my portfolio that I 
partner with people and they don't know I go over there and right. so I'll, I'll drive over there my summer I'll walk through the property I'll scope out the neighborhood so with these barrels can people do that so you definitely cannot go unattended um the opportunity to visit them exists uh you can definitely visit them but it's in a very structured manner because you know this is a a um you know an asset that is very much so regulated by the federal government and local government so, you know, we have a uh, DSP uh, for our facility where we store our barrels. Um, and so, you know, there's just a lot of regulations that come along with it. But we do have the opportunity, and I've participated in this myself, to be able to go visit your barrels and taste them. And, you know, like I I think I talked to you about this when we were talking previously, but it's a little bit of a romance investment. It's exciting to be able to go and see your barrels and taste them and be able to talk to your friends about it. You know, there's that excitement um, around it as well. And so those opportunities do exist. They're just very structured. Right. Now, one of the things you mentioned to me before was that each investor would actually be sort of planned for a set number of barrels. So it's not yes. like, so so each investor, if, if they don't follow through on their investment, those are committed barrels that you've already planned to buy. And so it yes. does create a bit of a, a challenge there. Yes, it definitely does. Yes. And so, you know, that's why it's important to have um, accredited investors. And then I also really like to work off of what I call character referrals. So, you know, if I have a personal relationship with somebody, I, I can judge their character and say, I know they're going to come through and commit to this and they're going to follow through on their word. Um, and so, you know, when it comes to being a degree or two removed from my personal circle, you know, then I'm depending on those character referrals to say, yes, this person's going to uh, follow through on that. And so, you know, of course we don't want to, but there are always avenues of borrowing money or something. If we get to the scenario where we have to cover somebody, but, you know, in our contract, I mean, it's very clear that that once you commit to this, you know, you're committed and we expect that you're going to be, um, you know, participating at the level that you've that you've expressed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, in that that couple of minutes there, you actually gave a lot of tips about how to raise capital, how to syndicate. Right. Because there's so many individuals that will verbally tell you that they can that they're interested in participating but then when it really comes down to transferring the funds over they're 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 not there right, right. and as the working partner that really puts you in a jam because and everybody else who who did did come come through exactly right? So, you know, those those skills like th that that you just mentioned is so important to make sure that your program works. Absolutely. Yes. And the accredited investor status is very important. And I know that there's levels that are above that, depending on the type of deal that you're involved with. But, um, you know, we we are I mean, I think right now. I think there are only two or three investors that own more than 1% of our company or our, sorry, not our company of our investment. And so, you know, that's helpful too. And having that diversification, I mean, if you want to look at that, like a, a stock portfolio in itself, like you want that mutual fund, you want that diversification. So on the side of the investors that can be beneficial as well, because, you know, if you're, if you have one investor that leaves and they are less than 1%, most likely the other people are going to be able to cover that one investor. Mm -hmm. So having that level of diversification from the investor side of things is nice, although it's probably a little bit more upfront work. Um, you know, it's a lot easier when you have one person that you can depend on to give you all of your money. But, you know, when you're dealing with a large group of people, it's almost like the more the merrier because it, it helps you hedge against those, those, those avenues for failure almost. Right. Right. So, that's almost like the whole idea of do I buy a single family property versus a multifamily property, right? Because if that one tenant in your single family disappears and doesn't pay rent, well, now you're 100% on the hook. Whereas Precisely. if you have a multifamily and one tenant out of, you know, 50 doesn't pay, right? Well, it's one fiftieth of exactly. the cost on you or the burden on you, right? Exactly. So, yeah. So it's the same sort of math that goes into yes. it. Yeah, it's 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 a it's a very similar model. And, you know, when I started going through this over and over again on the bourbon side of things, because I'd already had a property when I got serious about this. And so, you know, I was I was doing these parallels. And when you and I had conversation, they even brought more parallels out. And, you know, this is 
the real estate market is something that people very much so understand. It's been around for a really long time. The, the models make sense. The industry makes sense. And so when you can draw parallels to something that people are already familiar with, it, it helps with the conceptualizing of the, of the project as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, you know, when I look at you and you say, you know, Hong, I already have a, a, a couple of properties under my belt. I'm like, oh my God, did she start when she was five? Like, this is so ridiculous. No, I started when I was 23, still very young. Um, and I love to tell the story of when I bought my first property, I had a hundred dollars in my bank account and a $2,000 credit card bill. So I was waiting for that um, next paycheck to come from, I was working my engineering job. And so I remember sitting there being like, this is a little bit risky for me, but um, it's paid off. So I recovered from that quite well. <laughs> so, okay. So if you had to give advice to somebody who's sort of sitting on the fence, because, because right now the economy is so challenging right now. And a lot of people are afraid to take a move right? Mm -hmm. What advice would you give to somebody, whether or not it's to buy into real estate or buy into a bourbon barrel business to diversify? What, what sort of tips? Advice? Yeah. I mean, I'm all about diversification. Um, the more things you have your hand in the better, um, you know, and, and it's better when you have uncorrelated opportunities. Mm -hmm. So if you have two opportunities that are going to fluctuate based on the same indicators, you're, you know, you're going to see the same results at the same time. And the whole point is creating a baseline that's, that maintains itself. And so, you know, if you have money in real estate, money in the stock market, money in bourbon barrels, money in mutual funds, and one of those goes down, the other three are hopefully going to be able to support that because they're very different in the indicators that they follow. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, like I said, I'm a huge proponent for, for diversification, but at the same time, you know, you can probably say the same thing. There's never, there's never a better time to buy than yesterday in terms of real estate, at least, you know, the prices are continuously going up and, and, you know, although um, you may have different, uh, a different environment, whether it's interest rates are going up, housing prices are going up there, everything balances each other out. And so, you know, if you find something that works for you and fits into your model, go for it. It doesn't matter what else is going on in, in the market, as long as it fits your criteria and, your model and meets your numbers. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there, and another thing you can throw in there right now is the high yield savings accounts. That's something that's very safe to be doing right now. Um, and so, you know, if you're really unsure what you're, what you're doing, go with something that, you know, with your, that you're comfortable with, go with something that you really truly understand. I mean, that is another thing I would say you really need to be, understand what you're getting yourself involved with. Yeah. It's funny because so a couple of times I've had conversations with some of my clients and we're talking about, you know, like they, 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 they were able to, to save up some money and they're trying to figure out what to do with it, but they're afraid to take that next move into real estate right. or some sort of investment thing. And as we're talking, I realized that they're carrying a balance on their credit card. And I'm like, yep. why aren't you paying down your credit cards? And they're like, I, but I, I am, I'm paying the minimum amount. I'm like, no, that's no. not what I mean. Like, I mean, paid the entire balance off. And so then when we start talking about it, it's like, that's an automatic 18% return on your money right there because you're yeah. not paying that interest, right? So I think some of it is also just the education around yes, what they could be doing, right? Definitely so I, so. I really like what you said about, you know, if, if you're not sure what to do, then put it into something that like a high savings return account. Right. Because right now, yeah, we, we do have some stuff that are like around five or six percent. Mm -hmm. Right. Which is which is really good in an, in an uncertain environment. I mean, yeah. of course, everyone would love to hit a home run. But, you know, when you're playing with home runs, the risk is so much higher. So, you know, you got to know your own risk profile to be able to determine where your money goes and what yeah. you're comfortable being involved with. I mean, at the end of the day, you have to be comfortable with your financial situation. Yeah. Otherwise it's, you're going to spiral very quickly. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So one of the things I was thinking was when you were talking about the annual contribution, it sort of made me think about an insurance policy because every single year you have to pay that premium. Right. <laughs> right. And right. So, 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 so you're just, and so some of the insurance policies that I, I do for myself is the um, like the infinite banking concept, right? Or the um, the stuff where I'm my own banker. And so every single year I have to put the money in 
But then the insurance company turns around and gives me a portion of that money back. Right. Right. And so now I have this chunk of money that I have to go and make an investment with. Yes. Right. So yes. now my, my dollar is actually doing two jobs. Right. Which is great. So when you were talking about that annual contribution, I'm like, hey, wait a minute. I could do this with my insurance policy yeah. money. <laughs> exactly. That's a very, very true statement. And, you know, I've got some people that do their, you know, when they're running their own business. I mean, it's the same thing. You're you're very familiar with what's coming out of that opportunity. So um, it's great to have an opportunity to plan to put that somewhere else, too. Um, you know, I like to say I like to stay as invested as I can, you know, illiquid as I can. Um, because if, if your money's sitting in a checking account, you're not, you're not making any money on it. That's, mm -hmm. that's for sure. So, um, of course, you know, I'm a three to six months emergency fund type person that's probably sitting in a high yield savings account. But other than that, the majority of my net worth is involved in, in something it's, it's, it's growing itself in, in some form or fashion, whether it's real estate, whether it's bourbon barrels, whether it's a mutual fund, um, or, or just general stocks, you know, um, ideally, maybe a couple businesses down the road, um, but you got to start somewhere. So, yeah. Yeah. It's great that you have that sort of um, th that buckets of where you have your, your money pocketed. Cause I was reading this article about some of the family offices and they, they only have like four to four to eight percent of cash. Right. And, right. So, you know, and so, you know, in the past, when I was reading some of them, like Warren Buffett stuff, they were actually saying like 15 to 30 percent in liquidity. Right. So it's interesting hearing how people, you know, how, how much people set aside for right. emergencies and liquidity. Right. So it's interesting that the, the, the sort of like like that breakdown. So that's really interesting. Um, yeah. And, and everyone kind of has their own, you know, model. And, you know, as I get older, I think that I will become more older. liquid because my emergencies <laughs> will get a little bit larger. So, you know, that obviously changes too. And, and, you know, hopefully, hopefully everyone spends a little bit of time at the beginning or the end of the year saying, okay, this is what I anticipate my year is going to look like. And maybe I should be a little bit more conservative about these opportunities, but you got to know your own financial um, you know, aptitude, like the back of your hand. I mean, you, you have to really understand what's going on and, and be smart with your decision making and understand your risk profile. I know I said that earlier, but that's a big one too. Okay. So Morgan, I'm dying to ask you this. Okay. Where are you getting all of this knowledge from at your young age? Like I meet so many people who are in their like forties who don't even know half the stuff, you know, like where, <laughs> Great question. And, and, you know, it's, I've always told people, you know, I have an engineering background. I don't have a financial background. All of the financial information that I've learned is learned experience. And so, you know, the first person I have to give a shout out to is my dad. He's been a great uh, business mentor and life mentor. I mean, I remember being in the sixth grade and he was, or I don't know, I said, dad, you should open a restaurant. And he said, if you draw me out a business model and a business plan, uh, you know, we'll, we'll consider it. And so I remember spending every Friday afternoon at the library for like two months, uh, going online, searching me, how much does uh, a pinball machine cost? How much does it cost to have a waiting staff, all of this kind of stuff. And like, um, that was just for fun growing up. And he was very transparent with me with his financials. And, and I was very inquisitive, you know, I was in the 4-H banking club when I was very young and uh, I was just always very interested in that. And so he's a very successful businessman and he was very um, nurturing in, 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 you know, uh, seeing that through for myself as well. I've always been very entrepreneurial. I mean, I did like a duct tape wallet business when I was growing up and just like the cycle of finance, the cycle of a business, you know, it's been, it's been something I've always been interested in. And so I like to try to surround myself with people that feel the same way. So there's been a few people from different avenues in my life as well that are my age. And we just share these kind of things back and forth. It's like, I found this opportunity, look through it, see what you think, like where are holes that you find. And so um, definitely a lot of mentorship from people older than me, but I have a, a little circle that's my age, that's very interested in, in, in doing the same thing for ourselves. So that's been a lot of fun to, to kind of nurture myself as well. Yeah. yeah. You raise a really good point there about surrounding yourself with people who are of that mindset, 
right? Because mm-hmm. you're right. Like, you know, th- that common, um, th- that common thing that people say is like, you're the average of the five people you hang around. Absolutely. Right. And so if your closest friends are all business minded, then I, I, I can see where that drive comes from. Okay. Now you mentioned two things here and, and I just want to get you to clarify this. What's the 4-H biz club and the duct tape wall? Like, so, what? so for, we had a we had a, a program when I was growing up called 4-H and they basically had all kinds of different hobbies that you could do. And so there was a banking club. And so I would go to the banking club and basically they like I, the things I remember where we like learned how to balance a checkbook. We learned how to read a check register and how to read like, you know, uh, account balance statements and things like that. It was basically like if you ever had any interest in accounting that was a program that you could do and they had like a sewing club all kinds of things but I participated in the banking club um and so that's kind of one of the first things that I got the exposure of of you know how to run a business financials that kind of thing um and then what was the other one oh the duct tape wallet so when I was in middle school elementary school I would make duct tape wallets and sell them to my friends um just out of duct tape and that was one of the first little businesses I did. And then obviously, you know, like a lemonade stand did that growing up in my neighborhood. And then one of my friends and I actually built a business doing pressure washing um, because the town that we grew up in, uh, obviously there's a lot of distilleries and there's some soot that comes off of the, from the distilleries and just settles on everything. So we made a, a good chunk of change for a couple summers doing some, some pressure washing. So definitely have the entrepreneurial uh, itch. Okay. So, so at this age, you've actually already are a serial entrepreneur. I guess you could say so. (laughs) Okay. All right. Um, Okay. So I, I do have a question here because I have been looking at some other um, sort of liquor businesses to invest in. And one of the things that they always do is they'll send cases of samples and they'll offer to give cases of samples throughout the investment life. Okay. Is your company doing something like that? We are not at this time. Our biggest thing that we have been doing over the past few years is creating opportunities for the investors to come visit their barrels. Um, so that's kind of the thing that we do, and you get to sample it and you get to you get to try it. Um, but you know, we don't we don't have enough. We don't put our products in a bottle, so we don't really have the uh, the ability to ship out you know products to people. Um, now, some of our clients may do that. Um, and so we may get a few bottles here and there that we can share with our investors, but, um, you know, for the most part, um, no samples get sent out, but you will have the opportunity to, you know, come visit your products. Okay. Okay. So is this opportunity more ideal for somebody who actually likes bourbon and is a that type of hard liquor drinker, or is it just really for anybody? it's it's for it's for anyone interested in in you know the market so obviously the bourbon drinker is going to be way more um interested in the opportunity because you know like i said earlier it's a little bit of a romance investment i mean it's exciting you get to talk to your friends say hey i own a couple of barrels in kentucky and i can go visit them whenever i want like you know that's that's something that people really get a kick out of and so you know some people that are investing in this are investing in it for the opportunity to say that not even necessarily for the return yeah so you know it's it's definitely more appealing to those who have um a a liking for the space but at the same time you know it's it's so passive so hands-off you don't Mm -hmm. even need to like the product for it to be um something that's beneficial for you yeah it it almost makes me think of those um lifestyle real estate purchases that are being promoted like so where I am, there's, you know, condos that go up at Parksdale in BC and, and it's a lifestyle purchase. Like you buy it and you only own 20% of the condo, right? Yeah. Or like you buy um, a condo in Whistler because you're, you're going to go there and ski for two weeks out of the whole year, but then the rest yep. of the time it's, you know, passive and, you know, yeah. So it's sort of, it, it makes me think of that type of investment, but at the same time, it's, it's not part ownership though, either. Right. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. You have full ownership of the barrels that, that you purchase. And, and um, that's definitely another piece of it too. You know, you do have that full ownership. So that's very exciting. And, and although I agree with you totally on the, you know, when you're talking about a condo and a ski resort um, you know, it's, it's for those two weeks that you get to go there and that that's what makes it a value purchase for you. And, 
you know, of course that value purchase is more for somebody who loves bourbon than it is for somebody who doesn't, but there's obviously benefits for everyone involved. Yeah. Yeah. Especially when you're talking about just diversifying, right? Like if everything you have is in real estate, you know, and you're looking at diversifying, well, your only options are investing in a business or stocks, yeah. right? And so this allows you to potentially diversify in something else, right? Absolutely. So just, and, and, you know, like we said earlier, it's asset backed, very similar to real estate in that manner. You know, there's just so many parallels. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, I, I, I don't know, that's, what's made me so excited about it too, was, um, you know, once you can see a routine and a cycle, it's a lot easier to pinpoint other opportunities that follow that cycle, you know, mm -hmm. in years to come. So if there's another opportunity that comes across the table, that's asset backed, um, you know, your money's tied up for a bit, but it's not, not forever. Um, you know, you can kind of do that comparison and say, okay, this is a cycle I've seen before. Like, let's do this again. I believe in this cycle. I've seen it be successful before. Mm -hmm. So, so one of the, so because I was so excited to just like start asking you questions, I totally forgot to mention, okay, we do have to put a disclaimer out there. Okay. So before you go and do any investments or, you know, in, in the bourbon space, talk to somebody else who's done it, you know, do yes. your referrals. Do your research. Yeah. Do your research. Talk to a lawyer, talk to an accountant, all that stuff. Like make sure that <laughs> investing in bourbon barrels is the right uh, strategy for you. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> so, all right. So I've taken up so much of your time. So I'm going to give you um, the, 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 the last say what additional, um, things would you like to sort of say is sign off with before we go? Yeah. I mean, you know, if this is something you're interested in, definitely, you know, reach out. I'm happy to talk to you about everything under the sun. Obviously this is something I'm very passionate about. Um, it connects me back to my hometown. It's part of my heritage and it's something that uh, I'm, I, I love doing. So um, I'm happy to talk about real estate. I'm happy to talk about bourbon, happy to talk about stocks, you know um, I, I love that. So um, I'm sure if you're watching this, you're probably very like-minded and, and we can all relate on that level. So um, looking forward to to hearing from you guys. And I really appreciate you having me here today. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. I was actually at one point um, when, when I started doing more, more research before our first call, I was actually expecting like somebody in like farm uniform with a hay straw <laughs> coming out with the cowboy. Yep, the big hat on. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And, 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 and the thick accent. And I was like, Oh, yep. I didn't get any of that. Yep. So the accent comes out every now and then, but, uh, it's the more I've been away from Kentucky, the, the softer it's gotten, but my parents still have a pretty thick one. Yeah, that's cute. All right. All right. So thank you everybody for watching. Um, I love connecting with individuals, you know, talking about real estate and stuff very similar when it comes to money management. So thank you, Morgan. It's been amazing having you on and just sharing your ideas and just hearing how you think about stuff. So thank you so very much. It's my pleasure. I appreciate it. Thanks everybody for watching. Bye.